I always feel it's important that oh, we sh have sharp tools. And so once a year, we focus on how to sharpen tools. Terry is our expert at sharpening tools, but we have got four other people to present different methods that they use. And so what I'm proposing is that Terry will, will start off, followed by Jeff, followed by Jim, and followed by Gennady. Um, I think what I'd like to suggest is that when Terry finishes, we have a question, question and answer session, and then take it on with there. So over to you, Terry. Okay. Um, well, I don't know how long this is going to take, but let's have a go. Um, first of all, I'll say you're absolutely right. Sharpening is vital. It's a key skill. If you can't sharpen, you can't turn. And um, the position is, of course, that blunt tools tear the wood, whereas sharp tools slice it, and that's what you want. Um, and bear in mind that when you're turning for just a few minutes, the tool might well cut through a mile of wood. It gets blunt. Um, and especially if the wood is dirty, grissy, um, which some kinds of wood are, or some bits of wood get a bit gritty, um, if you store them near the grinder, for example. Um, or if the wood includes bark, bark is always gritty, uh, some worse than others. Um, so when people begin turning, they don't always recognise what's a sharp tool and what's a blunt one. Um, and they don't understand how often you need to sharpen. Um, there have been occasions where um, I don't turn the grinder off, I just leave it running. And, and I, I remember one occasion I had someone helping, they sharpened, I turned, they sharpened, I turned. And so I was being constantly supplied with a fresh edge. It was the only way to, to work on that piece of timber. It was horrible stuff. There's sand in it. Um, and it struck sparks off the tool. Um, but sharpness alone is not enough. The, the bevel has got to be at the proper angle and the edge has got to be properly shaped. Um, but anyway, how do you recognize bluntness and sharpness? Well, if you take a tool like a skew chisel, first of all, if you look at it, where are we? If you look at the edge, the cutting edge. If you can see the cutting edge, it's blunt. It should be invisible, invisibly thin. Second thing is you touch it to your thumbnail. Now, if it catches in your nail, then it's probably sharp enough. If it slides like a butter knife, uh, then it's, it's definitely blunt. Um, so those are the key points. Now, forgive me if I'm going too far back to basics, um, for everyone. Um, Julian suggested questions after I finish, but if, if anyone's got any vital points, I don't object if you, if you um, put in your questions as we go. Um, now, there's different methods of, of sharpening tools. Surprising number of people, when they start, think they can use an oil stone or a water stone. What I say about that is it's probably not impossible, but it's not very practical. Um, but they do have a use, those stones, for honing tools. More practical is a, a grinder. Um, I prefer grinders um, to uh, other systems, but um, different people have got their own preferences. If you have a grinder, uh, the wheels of about six to eight inches in diameter are probably most useful. If they're too small, you can buy four inch grinders. Um, the uh, bevel that they make would probably be too concave, which means that the cutting edge will be probably getting too thin and fragile. Um, now people um, these days go for slow speed grinders. That's not essential. If you haven't got a slow speed, slow speed grinder, um, it doesn't mean you can't sharpen the tools. Um, when I began, 
um, I had a, a high speed grinder with eight inch wheels with the old gray, basic gray wheels um, that these days they tell you you can't use. Well, I used to sharpen freehand on that and I used to sharpen carbon steel tools and it worked perfectly well. You have to make allowances for it and, and modern machines are better. But a slow speed grinder, if it's not essential, is a good thing. I haven't got one. Um, I think I wish I did. It, it's less aggressive in its cut, um, more controllable, less intimidating. And uh, sometimes if, if the things, if you've got a coarse wheel on and, and the high speed grinder, it's like feeding a pencil into a pencil sharpener. Your tool disappears before your eyes. Um, now, if you've got an eight inch grinder uh, of high speed kind, what you can do is switch it on, let it run up to speed, switch it off and do your sharpening. And that gives you the effect of a, of a slow speed grinder. High speed grinder is of course better for reshaping tools, it being more aggressive, where there's a lot of steel to move. But you do have to take care um, with any grinder if you're sharpening carbon steel tools. Um, the old fashioned tools, which there's hardly any carbon steel tools on the market as far as I know now, probably still a few. Um, and there's lots of secondhand ones and people inherit tools, don't they? Um, carbon steel worked for centuries, it still works now, but it overheats, it loses its temper. If you overheat it, um, you spoil the, the hardness of the, of the steel at that point, and it will turn blue. Um, so it's quite obvious when it happens. So when you're grinding tools, if they get too warm to hold, um, quench them in water and just carry on. So I might be sharpening a chisel and I'll have a go on the grinder and I'll just do that. And if I can do that, then it's not too hot. But bear in mind, the thinner the edge and the closer to the corners, the quicker it will heat up. Now, if they do overheat and they do turn blue, they won't hold an edge well in that spot, but don't despair, just carry on using it. Um, as you resharpen, you'll be more careful next time. Um, and the metal, um, the blue part will be ground away after a few more sharpenings. Um, and then you'll be back to uh, where you were. Now, when you're grinding high speed steel tools, heat doesn't really hurt them. Um, they can get red hot, literally red hot, and they cool down and they are good as new, really. Um, probably. The grade of steel has something to do with that, but um, you, you do hear people say, if they're getting too hot, don't quench them. I don't think, if, if you're following that rule of holding the thing, if, if it's not glowing red hot, I think you can quench it and carry on when it gets too hot to hold. The worst that can happen is you'll get microscopic cracks at the cutting edge, which is obviously not a good thing, but I think that's highly unlikely anyway. Um, now, if you're using a grinder, um, when you buy it, you'll find that the tool rests are almost certainly useless. They are flimsy, too small, hard to adjust. Um, so get rid of them, take them off, um, cut them off if you have to, um, and fit a platform, proper platform, which can be homemade, but you can buy them too. So that's the, the grinder, which I prefer. Now, some people use um, wet wheels like the Tormek and, and there are similar machines, um, a great deal cheaper. Now, I've got one of those. Um, I don't use it very often. Um, I know Jim, has invested in a Tormet, and perhaps I think he's going to talk about that. Tormets and similar machines give a really good edge, very sharp, um, 
and they use a jig system so they're accurate uh, repeatable they can be slow uh, as compared to a, um, a high speed grinder or, or even slow speed grinder um, they need maintenance they're extremely expensive if you get the tool mech they're not necessary the water cooling is not necessary at all for high speed steel tools and not really for carbon steel either, because uh, you can manage an ordinary high speed grinder, dry grinder, without burning the tools. Um, they are, but having said all that, they are really good in their, in their results. You have to decide what you want. Um, I think as you go through the years doing wood turning you you're constantly looking for a better way of turning a better way of sharpening a better way of doing all these things and so you need to experiment and and uh, you may find if you try that you like the wet wheel or you may find you you need you prefer something else you have to keep trying these things now if you've got a, a grinder um, the wheels come in different types Matrix wheels, um, by which I, I include the, uh, the stone ones, and the old fashioned CBN wheels also had a, a matrix. Um, with, and they have grit particles in some sort of binder. The CBN wheels have a, um, a very, now have a very thin layer of grit on the surface only. The matrix ones have to be kept clean and you have to dress them. That's essential. Um, this is the tool you can use. That's the one I use anyway. It's a little diamond in metal block on a handle and you use it freehand. Um, I've had this for years and years and years and, and as far as I can recall, it doesn't, never seems to get any shorter. Um, it works brilliantly and all you have to do is just run it across the surface of the wheel a couple of times just to clean off the embedded metal particles and refresh the, the cutting edge of, of the grid. Um, the ones you usually see nowadays uh, they have a little bit of metal tube box section tube with a, a thin layer of diamond grit on the front um, there so it's like a T shape they work, I, they're very coarse, I think, but um, I, I dare say they come in different grades. I don't think looking at them and, and having used them a couple of times that they're as good as this kind, if you can get it. Now the old gray wheels, um, as I said before, do work. If you get a grinder from, um, new or second hand, you may well find it's got these grey wheels on. They're not as good as, as the alternatives, but they do work and you don't have to rip them out and, and uh, change them. They certainly need dressing and maintenance, cleaning. And the purpose in, in both, of, of both kinds of wheel is not just to have a clean surface with freshly exposed grit, particles but also to um, make it run true take out the eccentricity um, there's enough eccentricity in wood turning workshops as it is um, now the next thing that's possible on these these grinders is the white wheels they're a step up from from the uh, the gray ones um, they're more friable they're softer so they wear quicker. The grey ones seem to last almost forever, um, but the, uh, the and the white ones don't. But you're constantly getting fresh grit exposed, so they work better. Um, they're supposedly better for high speed steel. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, another option is the coloured wheels. Now I um, I've got on my machine. Um, or one of my grinders anyway, a, a white wheel, uh, a blue wheel, which I think is some sort of um, ceramic. Uh, I've got that from Peter Child, 
he's out of business now, um, works really well. Um, and I've got a, a ruby wheel, um, which I think came from Peter O'Donnell. Was it Michael O'Donnell? I can't remember. Um, a supplier. Uh, again, a, a very nice wheel. Um, but they are getting more expensive. Every option is down the list is more expensive. Um, then you come to CBN wheels. Uh, we've all heard of those. Um, and what people say about CBN wheels is that they're great. They, they're the best thing that's happened to sharpening and wood turning for, for ages. Um, they never need dressing to make them run true. Um, they never wear out. There's a grain of truth in all that. Um, I've worn out a, a CBN wheel. I've not noticed really that they work any better than, than the stone wheels I've got. Um, they do cut cooler, I would think. Um, now, one point to bear in mind is that they don't need to be dressed. But that means that's because you can't dress them. The, if you were to try with the diamond block, you'd take the CBN grit off and there'd be nothing left. So you, although they can run perfectly true, no vibration, continuous contact with the tool all the way around the wheel, that depends on the machine, depends on your grinder. If the grinder is a little bit rickety, uh, then uh, a little bit out of true, cheap machines are likely to be like that, you can't correct it with, with uh, a CBM wheel. I think you can invest in special washers and things that will help, but um, I, I think they would need a reasonably good grinder to go on. Um, so that's all about grinders, high speed, slow speed, wet ones, um, different wheels. Terry, can Next, I go ahead. I just want to know about the, the grits. I mean, some paper has grits. Do yes. grinding wheels have grits? And I believe the CBN has got a much higher grit than the stone ones. They can do. They, they can be very coarse or very fine. Um, the one I had was a 180 grit which uh, when I got it, it was, you know, you do a bit of homework, a bit of research, and, and it seemed to be recommended as a basic all-purpose wheel. When I got it, it was really pretty aggressive. Um, I almost had to hold the gouge back when I was sharpening, otherwise it, it would have gone back right down to the handle. Um, you can get 80 grit ones, um, which would be really good, I, I would imagine, for, for reshaping us a big scraper that will take ages otherwise. Um, and they go up to 1200 grit, I think, or, or 1000 grit. Um, you're tempted to think, well, the finer the grit, the finer the edge will be that you get from on the tool. Well, that seems to make sense. Um, but, uh, this, of course, the sharpening will be slower with very fine grit. Um, but I note with interest that um, pro turners um, who have been apprenticed for years, you know, the really skilled people, will often use extremely coarse grind, grinding wheels, 60 grit, say, uh, even for skewed chisels, and they don't hone the tools. And they seem, it seems good enough for them. So um, this is what I was saying earlier. You need to experiment with these things and make your own mind up. But, but the usual advice that I'm aware of is that you start with a 180 and that will do probably almost anything. Um, but you will no doubt get a sharper edge with a, a finer grit. Um, whether you need that extra sharpness, I don't know. Um, and it will take you longer to, to grind a, a tool if it's fine grit. What about so, honing? Do we need to hone? Sorry? What about honing? Is that an essential part of sharpening? Um, well, I'm coming to that. Um, some people say the very fine CBN wheels are equivalent to honing. You use a thousand grit wheel, it's, it can give you almost a honed edge. But there's other ways to achieve that. 
Um, I was going to talk briefly about belt sanders, the Pro Edge system. Now, I've tried those. I, I made one or something similar. Um, I've tried the real one um, and I don't like it. I prefer the grinder, the ordinary bench grinder. But um, lots of people swear by them. I think there's people in the club that like them, um, possibly better than uh, they like the ordinary grinders. They produce a flat bevel, and so some people say that works better. Um, I've never noticed that it's, it's better. Um, but there you are. You have to decide for yourselves on that, I think. Um, perhaps when we open up the discussion a bit more, people will have their own views on that. Now, honing. Now, it's very quick to touch up an edge with a diamond card of these things um, or an oil stone, but it does take a while to get the knack. Um, I wouldn't say I'm at all good at it um, because it's very easy to round over the edge and that really spoils the, the cutting action. Um, honing with a fine stone gives a very sharp edge um, and it's easier with a long hollow ground bevel. One reason why I wouldn't like a a flat bevel, it makes honing harder. But of course, on the other hand, the, the Pro Edge system has got very fine belts and so maybe you don't need to hone. Um, now people will hone, hone the tools, something like that. And if you can get full contact along the edge without tipping, it works fine. With a flat tool, like a skewed chisel, another approach is to put the card or an oil stone on the bench, put your finger on the bevel, like that, to hold it in contact and just work away at it on the bench. I find that easier, but then I watch people on YouTube doing it this way and think, well, that's, that looks good, I must work on that. Um, if you're trying to do a gouge that way, it's a little bit more of a learning curve. But with, with honing, you must keep the edge, the bevel flat behind or hollow behind the cutting edge. Otherwise, um, you won't be able to align the tools very easily. Now that's hand honing. Um, what I do sometimes is power hone. Now, I, I made myself a power honing machine, which I'll just quickly show you. Quite heavy. Um, yes, and this has a hard felt wheel and an electric motor down below. Um, it's only a small one, probably a quarter or a third horsepower, driven by a belt and pulley. Um, and you put compound on this, um, Tripoli or, or um, green waxy stuff you can get. And it revolves, toward, um, revolves away from you. You stand here and uh, I'll find, get one of the tools. I'll show you how that works. Plug this thing in. Turn it around a bit. Okay, you see that, can't you? Okay, so well, it's running away from me now, and all I've got to do is by eye line up the gouge bevel on there and just roll it a bit. It's a bit like grinding the tool. Like that, and that will give you a polished bevel that will take your thumbnail off, not catching it. Um, 
So really good edge. It's uh, I, I should imagine it's as good as anything you'll get by other methods. Um, um, I'm sure you can buy machines that do the same job. Um, now, you can do that two, three times, but because the, the wheel has got a little bit of give in it, it does slightly tend to round over the, the bevel a little bit, round over the edge. And after you've done it two or three times, you would probably need to, to go back to the grinder and recreate a, a proper bevel. But it really does bring up a sharp edge. Terry? Yeah? Um, could I just ask, um, is there a problem with putting one of those felt wheels on your lathe and using your lathe as a honing motor? Uh, well, there is one problem, which is that the felt wheels are pretty expensive, it's surprising. But you can get a piece of MDF and put that on the lathe, hmm. compound on the edge, it works perfectly well. Um, there's less give in this, but a, a bit more bounce. So you, you need to keep the speed down and get it running perfectly true if you can. Um, make sure it's running away from you. The last thing you want is to have that coming towards the cutting edge. Uh, if, you, if, that, if you do that, you'll be sorry. <laughs> um, so those wheels, um, you, you can use, um, they come in different grades. You could use a, a buffing wheel uh, like uh, the Beal system very soft you put compound on it um probably triply um and it will again get a, get a beautiful sharp edge polished bevel like a mirror but it the more give there is in it the more it rounds over so the softer the wheel the more suitable it be probably for carving tools rather than turning tools uh, of which i've got no experience um, so I, I like the hard felt, um, other things are possible. I've heard of people using cardboard, leather. You can have leather wheels. In fact, the, the Tormek has got a leather wheel on it, hasn't it? And you put compound on that. And finally, there's the strop. I use a bit of leather belt glued onto a piece of wood and you put compound on that and either on the bench or I hang it on a wheel on, on the wall um, and you take the tool to it and put the bevel on and draw it down draw it down like that, same the other side. It takes off any burr that the grinding has, has given you. Again, gives you a beautiful sharp edge. Um, will round over the edge. Everything does that except the grinder itself. Um, but it's something you can try. And you can do that with a piece, a flat piece of MDF. Put the compound on, on the flat piece of MDF and Strop away. Can you talk about the burr, particularly on scrapers? Sorry? Can you talk about the burr on scrapers? Sure. How are we doing for time? Um, am I running over time? Um, I've, I was going to talk about carbide tools um, and then come on to uh, the different types of tool. Will that be okay, or do you want me to go straight to, to Burr's? That's fine. Uh, Terry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you use a polished belt, or is it the un is it the inside surface, the unpolished part? I remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it probably is the, uh, the softer side, looking okay. at it. Thank you. Um, either would work. The, the principle here is you want enough um, roughness on it to hold the compound, but yep. not enough, um, which is all waxy stuff, you, you rub it on. Or you can, 
if you put some three in one oil on it and you can use tea cut the metal polish oh, okay paint polish mm. um but that dries the powder and the oil you put on holds it on the surface yeah. so you want the compound whatever it is the abrasive to stay on it but the softer it is the more the um the bevel will sink in uh, and then the edge rounds over yeah okay. what compound do you use? what's that what what compound do you use do you use um, i use uh, i'm down to my last little um chip of it uh green um metal cutting compound um i would i'm pretty sure tea cut works so i think i've used that in the past i'm pretty sure the tripoli that you uh, put on the um, the Beal buffing system would work, but um, if you have if you're starting on it, I think the best thing is to get a metal cutting compound that's meant for cutting steel, hard steel. Yeah, thank because you. It's no good having a, a compound that's softer than you know the particles are softer than the metal. Thank you. Um, so having said that, uh, it really does give you a good edge. But I don't usually bother. I, I usually turn straight from the grinder. And the, the wheels on my grinder, I don't know, they're probably about 120 grit, 100 grit, something like that. Um, okay, now carbide tools, tungsten carbide tip tools, they have their uses. But a lot of people seem to think they've got magic powers. They haven't, they're, they're just scrapers and they do get blunt. And as the wood's gritty, they get blunt quickly. Um, and people say that they, they stay sharp much longer than high speed steel. Well, they stay blunt much longer than high speed steel because they're a pain to sharpen and expensive. Um, you, the edge chips. Now, um, so again, on the tungsten carbide tip, if you use your fingernail, the tip of your nail, and run, run it along the edge, obviously gently, you can feel it's got a slightly sawtooth effect when it's chipped. You could probably use a lens and see that. So the edge doesn't wear, it sort of flakes away, and you end up with something like a sort of flint nat stone tool. Um, and you have to deal with that. Um, you, can, you can turn the, the tip round. Um, bear in mind that a four-sided tip has only got two effective sides because you use the front and the two sides in one go. So you can only turn it 180 degrees in practice. Round ones, you've probably got three goes round the circle. Um, To sharpen them, you have to take them off the, the holder, off the tool, the and they come in two kinds. The flat ones, now you put those on the diamond file card thing with your finger on it and rub and rub and rub and rub and rub and rub and, and rub. It takes a long time, even with a coarse stone. Depends on how bad you let it get. Um, and then you want to go to a finer one, but you can sharpen them and they all come up as good as new. Um, I've never had the patience to get them as good as new. They just take too long, but it does work. Uh, now it ought to be possible to, with a, a little diamond disc of some sort, perhaps with a Dremel tool, to go around the bevel and shrink the, the uh, cutting tip a little bit, but restore an edge. I've not tried that. Um, and the other kind of carbide tip is the cut ones used on um, hunter tools, for example. Um, and they, they've got a, a little groove around the edge. I've tried to sharpen those, I can't. Um, I've tried setting them up, up in the lathe so they spin, going at them with a little round um, diamond ballpoint thing in a, in a Dremel. Um, and I can't get them anywhere near as sharp as, as uh, they, they are when they're new. Um, 
I think the way it must be done in the factory is with um, some sort of lapping system or, you know, fine diamond powder, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but if you have that kind, when they're blunt, you can treat them like the flat ones, sharpen the top surface, and that should convert them to a flat top carbide bit. Terry? Yep. Yes? I have a tool which I don't know how to sharpen. Let me show you. It's a scraper. A circular, it's got a circular disc on it. You see, it's not carbide. Where are you? Uh, no, I'm there. There it oh. is. Okay. Yes. So clearly you is that, you say that is carbide? No, it's not. It's HSS oh. steel. Right. And, and I'm never sure which way up to use it. I use it that way up. Has it got a, it looks, as you wave it about, it looks as if it's got a little top bevel as well. Is that right? Yeah, it's got bevels on both sides. Yeah. And I have no idea how to sharpen it. Um, well, you see, it's a, it's a round scraper. Yes, it looks like a round scraper. And you'd have to, what you'd have to do with that is um, take it off the tool and mount it on some sort of thing like a dop stick, like they use for, for lapidary work, you know, making gemstones and so on. So you've got a little holder and you can hold it up to the grinder and spin it in your fingers and sharpen it like any other tool. It seems a lot of trouble to me um, for what is basically a, a, a small, limit, very limited life and um, negative rate scraper. Yeah, but it works very well when it works. Yes, I'm sure it does, if you get it sharp. Um, but I'll come to negative rake scrapers in a minute. Um, Thank you. I'm just going to interrupt once. Uh, David, by Atomic. Uh, <laughs> they do it, do they? No, the jig comes with it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you put it on, the, on a flat platform without a holder, hold it down and spin it, that will do the same job. But that takes your fingers mighty close to the wheel. So uh, that would that would be uh, perhaps unwise. Um, you, David, you can buy a jig precisely for that from Sorby. I've got one. Really? I might sell you at an exorbitant price. Okay. Yeah. I'll anyway, I'll, I can speak to you about that later. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, now with the other tools, um, I can say something about the grinding angles and edge, edge profiles. Um, people do, when they begin, puzzle over what's the right shape for a cutting edge and what sort of angles to use. Um, first of all, fingernail grinds, um, as used on spindle gouges and bulk, most bowl gouges these days, they should have flat or slightly convex wings, that's the swept back part, without low spots and without corners, sort of angles in the, in the bevel, which um, caused by poor grinding. Um, the nose of the tool shouldn't be dropped. It shouldn't uh, dip down at the, the, at the very tip and it shouldn't have a point unless some special purposes you might use a point, but normally it wouldn't. And it shouldn't have a spade tip. And that's easily done. If you overgrind the, the nose of the gouge, you get a little flat on the end, um, which stops it working properly. Um, a spindle roughing gouge should be ground straight across. Here we are. I, 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 for some reason, always have liked a shallow roughing gouge. Um, I've had that one for 40 years. Um, <laughs> there's still lots of it left. Um, and that's sharpened on a platform. But you see it's straight across there. The corners need to be kept sharp. If you over, if you over roll it on, on the grind, you will lose the corners. They'll be 
cut back a little bit and that will affect its use for some purposes. Um, what else? On a skew chisel, the points there, the long point and the short, the long point and the short point need to be sharp. Again, you don't want to have those rounded over, which could easily happen if you overgrind them. That's even if the edge is curved, you can have a curved edge on a skew chisel or a straight edge, but even if it's curved, you want sharp points, the long and the short. But the angles and the shapes differ according to how they're used. Um, people have got their own preferences. Uh, you can pay a lot of money and get people's signature tools, which are a particular shape, particular angle. Um, uh, and I'm sure they all work well. You get used to whatever shape it is. You get used to different angles. But the principles here are that the keener the angle, the more acute the angle, the more freely it will cut, but the less durable it will be probably. Um, and angle, that's a gouge cut across the bottom inside a bowl. So it's really helpful to have two bowl gouges, or at least two. One fairly keen, which will do the outside of a bowl nicely. You, you've probably heard of the 40-40 grind. That's all very popular these days. Um, great for the outside of a bowl, great for the inside, part way down the wall, but useless, depending on the shape of the bowl, useless usually for going across the bottom. So you then go to a, um, a more obtuse grind for that. Now the spindle gouge, um, oh, sorry. Um, on a, a bowl gouge, no, I beg your pardon, on a, on a spindle gouge I'll, I'll talk about, um, having the, a sweep angle, by which I mean the angle, can you see which way up that is? You get, can you see that? Yep, yeah. that's, the, that's the bevel angle. That is the sweep angle. And on this one, the sweep angle is pretty shallow. That way. Um, having a sweep angle like that, and having the tool more pointy, not with a point, but more pointy, if, if you know what I mean, um, lets you go cut deeper coves. Um, a more gently rounded end, more like a thumbnail than a fingernail perhaps, um, will uh, give you a, a more wider, a, an easier, long cut but, but um it's not so effective for small coves in fact it can't do very small coves but with a bowl gouge having a swept back edge helps avoid catches um, and if swept well back like the Ellsworth grind uh, That's the, what I mean by the Ellsworth grind. It comes, goes by other names as well. Um, having the long sweep, uh, long wings um, enables you to use it in different ways. Um, you can use the wings to scrape, half scrape, sheer scrape, and you can also make push cuts. So people, lots of people get on very well with these tools. You, but a traditional grind, though, like that one, well, yeah, <clears throat> that's ground much less of a sweep angle, sometimes even straight across, like, like 90 degrees, like a spin of roughing gouge. And a, a much more obtuse bevel angle, so compared to the other end, which is a bit more sweep and a keener angle. This 
is better for going across the inside bottom of a bowl. Um, now you can measure these angles with protractor. Like this. Um, and the angles we're talking about, so the bevel angle would be that one, which is not quite right. There, something like that. Whereas the sweep angle is, uh, where are we? More like uh, more of that angle there. That's the screen. This, that's the sweep angle there. You see that? As it gets the bevel angle, which is uh, there. But these angles are not critical. Um, people have got their own preferences. Um, different angles work for different purposes. Uh, you get used to whatever you, you have been using. Um, but typically, a spindle gouge will have a bevel angle of about 40 degrees. A bowl gouge, somewhere between 40 and 85 degrees even. Um, scrapers, typically around 70 degrees. Um, negative rate scrapers, now they could be, uh, opinions on negative rate scrapers vary a lot. Some people say have top and bottom bevels the same. Um, some people say about 40 degree, degrees lower and 30 degrees on the top. You have to try and make your own mind up. Skew chisels, um, about 40 degrees included angle. Um, but a rule of thumb for, for skew chisels is the length of the bevel should be about one and a half times the tall thickness. So the length there should be about one and a half times the tall thickness. And on this one, it's not. So I could, following that rule, make that a bit keener. But because it's quite a thick tool, it gives quite a good bevel anyway. Um, and the skew angle, that's the angle there, like that, can you see that? That angle should be about 70 degrees. Where are we? Is that showing? Yes. But again, plus or minus, it's up to you. Um, and of course, you can sharpen these with a curved edge, um, and some people prefer that. These things go in, in uh, you know, what goes around. They, they, they go into fashion, they go out of fashion. Um, okay, now, jig grinding. I'm going back to grinders here. Um, if you're sharpening a spindle roughing gouge, a skew chisel or a scraper, then the best way to do that is on a platform. You can um, <clears throat> if that represents the grind wheel and this represents your platform, all you've got to do is lay the tool on the platform at the proper angle and put it on the wheel and slide it backwards and forwards for the, for the flat tools. Um, scrapers, you wouldn't have to, you may have to slide it, you may not, depends on the size of the tool. The spindle roughing gouge, you just, uh, you just roll it like that against the stone. So those are easy. The tricky part is getting the angle right getting this angle right here. Um, you can buy systems, the Wolverine system, for example, works like 
that and you can adjust it quickly to whatever you want um, and there you are and you can slide it in and out. Um, you can make systems like this. If you do, uh, it's best to have the pivot point at the front. So pivots like that, not like that. That's, that works, but that's better. Because doing it this way, you stay close to the wheel. Um, for safety, the gap between the, the rest, the tall rest of the platform and the wheel should be absolute minimum, almost touching. So your fingers don't get in there. And you are, when you're grinding, working with your fingers very close to the wheel, so you have to watch out for that. Um, so platform grinding for the flat tools is very easy. Platform grinding for um, gouges is a skill that you can learn quite easily. But before we come to that, um, just briefly talk about how to set these angles. One recommendation is you get a, a, five, a felt tip pen and black the, the bevel and put it on the tool rest and adjust the angle and on the wheel until the, you just get best contact. And that works, but it's a bit slow. And if there's any cumulative error, even a thousandth of, a thousandth of an inch, um, it will gradually change that angle because you're copying the one before each time. Um, so another way to do it is with, for example, with my 40 degree template. And what you do is put that on, on the wheel, let's show, and adjust the platform to that. Okay. Um, Adam, I've got a photo of that I sent you that might show it more clearly. Okay. One minute. Um, let me find it. Yeah, I've got it. That's the one. Yeah. So all you need to make one of those is to put your uh, tool rest the platform in the proper position for what you want and you do that by trial and error or what, however you want to do it get it right lock it then you get a scrap of ply or mdf or anything um, make a cut out uh, it has to have a flat edge flat, which will fit on the uh, on the platform you make a cut out which will fit the wheel but uh, you only want two points of contact on the wheel. Um, so you can either cut the curve a little bit hollow, so it's touching at the top and bottom only, or as I usually do, I put in some little, little wood screws. Uh, there's one at the top and one just above the platform, if you can see them. Uh, and then you've got metal contact on the wheel, which of course is switched off. Um, and uh, also because they're screws, you can, adjust the fit slightly if you want to, to change the angle very slightly, but I don't find I ever have to do that. So that's, that's ever so easy to make up. And um, what it does is gives you the same platform angle every time. It references to the wheel. Um, it uh, saves a lot of mucking about. Um, the only problem with it is that the angle that, at which the tool hits the, touches the wheel depends on the thickness of the tool. Can you see that the thicker the tool, the higher up the wheel it's going to be, and the more acute the angle is going to get. Mm -hmm. So you may, may want uh, more than one of these templates um, for different tools, but I, I find most tools will go on one template. Mm -hmm. um, then, um, then we come to platform sharpening of gouges. Um, now, that involves setting, uh, that I think is photo two, maybe, 
You got that, Adam? That one? No. no. Uh, yes, that, that will do. Um, that's the, a little uh, jig, that, a little template that sets the arm position. And again, it's got two little uh, little screws to, to uh, get metal contact and a length that suits the position of the pocket in the, the, uh, in the arm there. So you can slide it in and out till it just makes contact. You can do it with something as simple as just a bit of dowel in between the, the pocket and the wheel. But this is a more positive arrangement. And again, ever so easy to make. Shape is immaterial. It's just that it sets the distance between the wheel and the uh, pocket in the extension arm there. Um, you also need to, uh, on the Wolverine system, the very nice system, can you come back to, to me? Yeah, this is, this is the uh, jig, the temp, the, yeah, this is the jig that uh, grinds gouges. Um, where are we? And you would put your, put the gouge in. Set that distance. You can use just a simple stop that would uh, do that. But this angle here, where are we? there's a pivot point there and a lock there. So that arm swivels. Um, and I use this little template. It's just two bits of stuff. Having got it right, you get it as you want it. And then what you've got to do is be able to go back to that same setting. So I use just two bits of MDF, which fit fit like that. So I've I've got that reference for the angle against the two flat surfaces. Again, it makes it very quick and easy. But um, in practice, I find I've, I've only really got two settings for this, one for spindle gouges and one for bowl gouges. Um, now the method of, of platform sharpening, um, that, sorry, that's for the jig, using the very grind jig. Um, and that's it, very easy to sharpen with a jig. Um, so uh, there's a short video of that. Um, Adam, uh, that is video number one or two. Video one, the short one. Yeah, that that bloke. Um, it's just a, about four or five, four minutes or something. This is how he sharpens bowl gouges. So that might be worth a quick. Uh, Can everyone hear that or not? No. Okay. I think about longer. Give one minute. Ah, oh, oh, shut up. Let's try that again. Hey everybody, Jim Ballard here, Wood Turner in Tennessee. I'm going to show you how I sharpen my 5 8 bowl gouge. Let's get started. All right, so what I got here is a grinder and the Wolverine repeatable grinding system that I picked up from Woodcraft. These are interchangeable, one side to the other, finer blade, rougher blade. I cut the notch in, cut the notch in this so I can get a little bit closer with some other tools. This is the one we're going to use right here. First thing I do is I pull out a piece of this copper tube, a little 3 8 tube, doesn't really matter what it is. And I have it cut seven and one eighth of an inch. I 
put it in, I push it up, I tighten. Now, it doesn't matter if this wheel gets smaller, this will always be that distance. Next, I get my bowl gouge out. Slip it in this attachment part from Wolverine. All I can tell you is I got it on the second notch for the angle. Whereas this is close to a 90. I don't know if that's a 45, but it's just a second notch in the Wolverine. Then I'm going to set the depth. You've got to have a certain amount of depth here. So, hey Lucy, come here. <laughs> hey girl, you going to help me do some grinding? Hmm? Yeah, she's a cool girl. Okay, watch out. I'm going to take this. And I'm going to put it against here, and I've got it set. This is set for two inches. A little stop block. Right at two inches. Tighten it up. She's good to go. All right, so here you go. You put it inside the pocket. The depth is set, and you're going to work it back and forth. It doesn't get its shape by magic. You still have to have a little finesse to get the actual shape, but we'll show you how that happens. And that's it. There it is. That fast. So when you can repeat the grind, it feels the same that you've been using. And it takes off very little metal and shortens this thing very little. It, every time you sharpen it, it gets shorter and shorter. And these things are expensive. So there you have it. If you have any questions, comments, please leave them in the uh, comment box. And thank you for watching. Please subscribe. See ya. Okay. Um, he says this is the way I grind a bowl gouge. It's the way everyone finds grinds a bowl gouge. So there's lots of demonstrations of that on YouTube, um, and they're worth watching. Um, if anyone wants to look on my website, I've got a little article on how to set the. Uh, um, the different angles and distances to suit a particular grind that's something you don't see very often um now um video two adam uh, shows um cindy drozda uh, another american turner um using the platform to grind gouges so can we see that one Cindy Drozda Instructional Woodturning DVDs presents Sharpening Gouges. In this video, I'll show you how I sharpen the gouge that I use to turn my fine finials. My Cindy Drozda Signature Spindle Gouge. All of my gouges are sharpened with a 40 degree cutting bevel angle on the tip and on the wings. To sharpen a gouge, I use a Wolverine platform system with the platform set to give me a 40 degree angle. I'll start by sharpening my spindle roughing gouge and bowl gouge. If I hold the gouge flat on the platform and touch the edge to the wheel, I should get a bevel of 40 degrees. If it measures less than 40, I'll lower the top edge of the platform and try it again. Until I'm grinding a 40 degree bevel. My fingers on the bottom of the platform and my thumb in the gouge flute pinch the gouge down onto the platform. My other hand supports the tool at its balance point. Since this gouge has no sweep, 
the entire bevel is sharpened by just rolling the handle. The gap between the tool and the platform shows that I'm not firmly holding the tool on the platform and I will not be grinding the 40 degree bevel angle that I want. To grind an accurate bevel angle, there should be no space between the tool and the platform. When the tool is held flat on the platform, with the handle straight back in line with the grinder, the grinding marks on the cutting edge are perpendicular to the cutting edge at that point. For the grinder grooves to be perpendicular to the edge on the wing, the handle needs to swing to the side. At the same time, the tool needs to be rolled so that the inside surface of the flute will remain parallel to the platform. The easiest way to sharpen a gouge using this method is to sharpen one wing, sharpen the other wing, and then blend them at the tip. The white lines on the platform are at 40 degrees. If I swing the handle to line up with the white line, I'll get a 40 degree sweep to the wing of the gouge. Shortening the cutting bevel makes it easier to cut clean coves. This I'm going to just do freehand. Here's the edge shape that I'm looking for. The wing is straight or slightly convex and the tip makes a smooth transition between the two wings with no dips or bumps. The width of the bevel right at the cutting edge is about a sixteenth of an inch. In order to be sure that I have the bevel angle exactly what I want on the wing of my gouge, I want to be sure that the inside surface of the flute is parallel with the grinder platform. You notice that the flute of the gouge is not in the fully closed position when the inside surface is parallel to the grinder platform. If I were to roll the gouge over until the flute were completely closed, in other words, for this line across the flute to be vertical, the inside surface of the flute would not be parallel to the grinder platform. And the bevel angle on the wing of the gouge would not be 40 degrees. A bowl gouge has a different flute configuration than a spindle roughing gouge. This is why the bowl gouge does not need the flute rolled all the way over to the closed position for the inside surface of the flute to remain parallel to the platform. To make that long sweep angle that I like on my spindle gouge, the handle is swung further to the side to sharpen the wing. The notch that I have cut into my Wolverine platform makes this a lot easier. Creating and maintaining the shape of the edge does require some sensitivity. More pressure against the wheel is required on the wings than at the tip where only very light pressure is needed to maintain the shape. Reducing the width of the cutting bevel is even more important on the spindle gouge since it's used for delicate work. Grinding down the heel of the bevel is done freehand, using my hands on the platform for stability. The accuracy of the angle of these extra bevels is not important. The goal here is just to get the metal out of the way so that the heel of the gouge doesn't rub in the cut. The cutting bevel has been blackened for visibility. Its width at the tip is less than a sixteenth of an inch. The shape of the wing is straight or slightly convex. The sharp edge of the heel has been ground smooth. 
The shape at the very tip is an eighth inch semicircle. That's the way I sharpen all of my gouges, using a Wolverine platform. Please be sure to visit my website, cindydrozda.com, for more information about my signature. Okay, thanks, Adam. Um, so the gist of that uh, was that for the fingernail or swept back gouges, you've got to combine a rolling action with a swing action on the platform and use the, the platform just to give you the angle, but it doesn't give you the shape of, of, the, of the edge. You do that by grinding a bit more here, a bit more there, um, until you, you're happy with the shape. Now, another option is freehand sharpening. And that's how I started. Um, so you don't use a platform, you don't use a jig, you do it completely freehand. Um, I started that way because the jigs hadn't been invented basically then. Um, I used probably flint tools rather than um, So uh, I won't show you that now, but it's a similar action. You, you, you support the tool in your hand, hand on the tool rest or some sort of fixed reference point, hold the tool in your hand, it's a gouge, and you offer it to the, to the wheel, and you sort of learn the angle, you, you've, you've come to know the angle, also you could feel the angle on the stone, the bevel, and you sort of roll it and push it upwards like that. And you do it completely freehand, similar to the way I was using that homing wheel earlier. And it's a skill that you can develop. It's, it's rather similar to wood turning. So if you can do that, you can probably sharpen. So that's all about gouges. Um, the last thing I wanted to cover quickly is ticketing um, or burnishing a burr. Um, David, you were asking about this. You can, with scrapers, you can sharpen them on the platform, dead easy, and you get a burr, um, which cuts pretty well. Um, but a ticketed burr, like on a cabinet scraper or a burnished burr, you'll see it called, um, is not only sharper, it's more durable. So to create that, you stone off um, or polish off the grinder burr, then create a new one. Now, I, for, for that, I use a, a carbide rod in a handle. I got this from eBay. And This is a negative rate scraper, but you could do it on an ordinary scraper as well. What you do is get rid of the top. This is the top, right? If it's got a burr, you either take it off with a, with a diamond card, uh, or you can use the felt wheel, or you can use your burnisher. Lay it flat on the bevel and just go across couple of times just to press down the burr that's left by the grinder. Then, on an ordinary scrape, it will be the top surface. Then you go to the back, and if I pretend that's the back, because you'll probably see it slightly more clearly, you put the, the burnisher there, lift it just a, a little bit off the, off the bevel, and just go across with a little gentle pressure, not much pressure. And you will find, if you've done it right, that there will be a, a little hook left on the edge, which you can feel. That cuts better than the grinder burr, and it's longer lasting. So it's, it's worth doing. Um, another thing you can do is, um, sharpen the scraper on the honing wheel, which uh, I have to do freehand. I don't do this very often, but that gives a burr. It pushes the metal over the edge, which seems to be the sharpest I've found yet. It really cuts nicely. 
But these, these burrs or scrapers don't last long, even, even the burnished ones. Another way you can produce the, the uh, burr is with a, a diamond card, and you just sort of do that, not on the bevel, but just, just on the edge. So you're lifting it just a fraction. Can you see that? There. So five degrees lift, I don't know, something like that. And just gentle sharpening action will raise a burr on the far side, um, which you can feel with your thumb. Now, if you overdo it, if you press too hard, if you have the angle wrong, you'll fold over the burr. You'll create the burr and then it'll be folded and it won't cut well. So it's gentle action. Now you can do this two or three times. Um, you having sharpened it, use the tool. It starts to not cut so well. So you then come back and you get rid of the burr from the top, put a new one on from the bottom. Um, and you can do that two or three times, but each time you're losing metal from the cutting edge making the cutting edge itself blunter because you're converting it into a hook. And so you have to press a little harder each time. Um, and after a while, it just gets difficult and you go back to the grinder and start again. So three times and then repeat the cycle. Now, if you want to try this, you can use a diamond, as I said. I have in the past used the back of another tool as long as the metal, this, the burnishing part needs to be harder metal than the, the cutting part. Just for interest, I tried using a glass bottle. That works. Um, you wouldn't want to stay using that because um, you don't want bits of glass in the workshop because they get broken. But um, to try the action, if you haven't got anything else, it does work. You could probably use stone, a, a smooth um, bit of flint or something. Um, Terry, we've got yeah. three other people who have got have prepared something as well. Well, as it happens, Julian, um, I have now finished. <laughs> yeah. That was the In end. that case, I would like to thank you. Fascinating. I noticed you have some quite copious notes. Yeah. Would you mind if we, if you sent them to Adam so he could put them onto the website? Sure. I think that would be quite useful for us to refer to. Okay. Yeah, sorry to take up so much time. No, fascinating. Thank you, Terry. There's a lot, a lot of very valuable ideas. Um, I, I, I can't, I'm going to leave question time until the end. Yeah. So, Jeff, you've got a different approach to sharpening. So, uh, we can only see your forehead. <laughs> And unmute yourself, please. Hi, uh, Terry, that was brilliant. Um, I'm glad you weren't wearing safety open toed sandals like that lady demonstrator um, <laughs> had. But there you go. Um, Adam's got, I think, three or four very short videos. They're only 20 odd seconds each and two or three pictures. Um, I must stress this is purely like Chan Canasta used to say on TV, an experiment. Uh, it's got to be worked on. There are things, lots of adjustments and things to do. So Adam, I don't know if you still got the things. Yes. In, I, I did label them one, two and three in the last. In the uh, yeah, I have them. So do you want video one first? Yep. Try that. Okay. Uh, I turned the volume down a little bit because it's uh, a little bit screechy. But this is video one. Okay, um, that looked like it was a, um, actually the definition was, was quite poor. Um, 
I, th I think that was um, fingernail, spin spin a small spindle uh, tool. Um, what I'm using there are, I've got six different diamond grits on three double-sided discs uh, going from 80 through to 1200. Now, the great advantage of that is, of course, it's uh, variable speed, comes off the lathe almost immediately. Um, I think I was using probably 180 on that, I don't know, or maybe 1200, I can't really remember, I ended up with 1200. Um, what, it is difficult to control the tool. Um, the flat, any, any flat top, flat chisel, no problem at all. It's just a simple, simple platform. Just copy the angle. Once you get to the next video, uh, you'll start seeing some wobbles. So if you, I don't know if you want to play that, Adam. That, that's my cue. Hang on one minute. Now you can see here, um, if you want to mute it, I don't know if you can mute that as well. Um, All right, let me, let me, there we go. Okay, what you have there is, um, a rough, small roughing gouge. Um, that's far more easier to control than a flat chisel, uh, and, I've knocked up, that's just a piece of plastic pipe to help the curve, the smoothing of the turning of the tool. And it, it was quite successful. Doesn't look as if it was from here, but it, 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 it did quite a good shape. Um, and the, la the last one, I'm gonna stick that on, is using uh, the one-way system now, this is very tricky because there's loads of things in the way of that tool when, you're, when I swing it. Um, I was doing this on the 1200 grit. Um, there are things in the way. I've had to modify, cut lumps off things, and I'm getting there. It's, it is difficult to control, but I don't think it's impossible at all. And I'm, uh, I'm working on it. Um, now, there, there are the advantages, uh, variable speed. Uh, there are a couple of pictures, um, Adam, mm -hmm. flash them all quickly. Um, might be two or three, I don't know. You, can, you might not be able to see that, but that's almost a mirror finish on that. But the tool is lopsided. The cutting edge is lopsided because I haven't been able to swing it right over. Um, that takes a bit more playing around with. Um, the discs are handy. They're hanging on, on a shelf. A picture of it. They're the other two. So they're all double sided. So that's it. As, as I said, Chan Canesta would have called it an experiment, especially when it went wrong. But it's... Um, I'm, I would say I'm 70% uh, of the way there. Um, that's it, a new, different approach. Are they diamond discs? Yes, there's, yes, that's the whole point. Uh, so 80, 180 grit, 350, 600, 800, and 1200 grit. And Jeff, do you mount them on an old lathe, or is that the lathe that you're turning wood on? That, that's my wood turning lathe. They just, it's on a one morse taper. So you have to unmount whatever you're turning to mount the wheel to shut well, it. I wouldn't take it off a chuck. Right. Not a problem. No. Ch chucks come off uh, very easily these days. Well, they should do. And you don't really want to take the, the, the piece of um, the item you're turning off the, out the chuck anyway. Um, anyway, it's another. It's something else to play around with, isn't it? I mean... Life's boring, isn't it? I want to make it too easy. Well, there you go. I rest my case for insanity. <laughs> Very good. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Now, 
Any questions? No, don't bother. <laughs> Any questions? <clears throat> okay. Moving on to Jim Briggs. Sir, wet grinding. Hello, wet grinding. Oh, damn. Sorry, I forgot my piece of paper. And you're thinking, why am I in the kitchen? Well, that's part of it. Because that's in fact, if I go back to the kitchen, the very first question on my piece of paper, you'll notice I'm in the kitchen. And let me have had a pair of music stand. You can see, okay, what's going on? Out amongst yourselves. Adam, could you highlight me so I can see how I'm on screen? I have highlighted you. Oh, I'm not seeing the I'm seeing the old little screen. Um, no, you are spotlighted. Oh, okay. So, oh, uh, oh, I'm right. seeing the F on the screen. There you go. Sorry. Oh, oh no. I can see myself now. Right. Yes, this is my kitchen. There's the kitchen sink, and my head's gone. <laughs> Worked in the practice. When I was trying to do this a bit earlier, I was using the camera on the iPad, and everything lined up rather beautifully. So presumably, when it's Zoom, it's a different um, sugar. Maybe I'll just squat down a bit. I don't actually have that much to say here. Um, so, why am I in the kitchen? Most people would have their um, sharpening system in the, in the workshop. Well, I got the sharpening system long before I ever had the lathe. And I didn't have a workshop. So, I parked the lathe in the kitchen um, and uh, to practice with. And uh, I did have my tools, chisels, by then. So uh, I also um, was having a problem sharpening with them. Um, I did also spend rather a lot of time sharpening my knives, kitchen knives, and something just erupted. I think it might be my boiler. Um, kitchen knives, and I've got another set of kitchen knives as well. He didn't do terribly well, that guy. Um, right. So when I bought the when I bought the machine, uh, it had a stone wheel on it, in particular this one. Um, uh, then I was having all kinds of problems with it. Uh, I was trying to reshape the chisels to what I thought, what I then told would be the proper angles and things, um, proper bevel angles. And then it just wasn't working for me. Um, so then I had a long chat with Brian uh, at David's barbecue some time ago, and he gave me a little a little talk about it. I thought, oh, that's what I'm doing wrong. So amongst other things that comes with Tormek is this little thing. It's got a diamond bit just there, and that when this bit here is up there and the stone's there you can resurface the stone with this thing um, which is ever so natty and it works very very well and it locks into that vertical thing right there with a thumb screw behind and why am I telling you all this because you probably already know most of it um, because in my particular case with this mechanism here and the stone on it, and it was rolling and going, um, I did turn my back at one stage to, to pick up another chisel or something or other. And um, 
this is the way not to do it. Because if I turn the wheel that way around, you'll notice there's a damn great gouge in this stone all the way around. Um, that's because this little thumb screw came loose. <laughs> that wasn't good. That was kind of a bad thing. Um, okay, why do I buy a Tormic? Uh, I went shopping to Axminster, uh, knowing absolutely nothing about sharp, well, virtually nothing about sharpening, but I was aware that uh, uh, unlike what, what Terry's just said, I thought temperature was very, very important in the steel. Um, with the wet trough here, which is, which is adjustable, you bring it up and down. Uh, the wheel is running in, in, a, in water, in a trough of water down here. The wheel is cold the whole time. You can put your hand on it at any time. You can put the, uh, you know, put your hand on the chisel that you're sharpening, and it's it's cold. There's there's no no warming of it whatsoever. Um, this only turns at about eighty RPM, um, so there really is just no possibility of getting it getting it hot. Uh, now then, I went. Uh, the stone wheel over there, which I've just shown you. And this one here is actually a diamond wheel. Sorry, I thought I was the only one talking. <laughs> um, yeah, this one here is actually a diamond wheel. So why did I go to the expense and bother of a diamond wheel? Well, I did a course with Phil Irons on um, Holoforms, and he had a diamond wheel, and he had exactly this setup. And the chisels, when I, when I was using his chisels and sharpened them on this system with the extra fine diamond wheel, honestly, they, they come up like razor blades. They really are. They, it's just so amazing just how sharp you can actually uh, get a chisel. And the other thing I found was suddenly turning became comparatively easy um, <laughs> because I had a sharp tool for a change, um, a, a very, very sharp tool for a change, which was rather nice. Um, let's see. Now we have the combination of water in a trough here, and we have a very expensive diamond wheel, which is on metal. So you have a metal wheel running in a, in a trough of water. Um, that's a rather bad combination. Okay. Now, Tormic has the answer to that, or so they say. Um, it's this little bottle of concentrate, which this one's empty. Um, this holds 250 ml. It'll make about three liters of, of water. Um, one thing I've never quite understood about it, what I actually did is mix it up in a water bottle and write Tormic across it. Now, I've never understood why um, this liquid here it settles into the bottom. Okay, you notice there's this white substance down in there. I don't know what it is, and I don't know why it's there. So what I actually do is sort of rattle the bottle around, and bingo, it looks like that. Now my theory is that when this is setting idle, um, all that white stuff in there, which probably should be there, is then settled into the bottom of this little trough here. Um, so what I've done just recently, the other thing that happens actually is it evaporates really quickly. And that, that little bottle of concentrate is about 15 or 20 quid's worth, okay? But it does seem to evaporate 
surprisingly quickly. So I just recently thought, I know what I'll do. I'll clean out the trough and I'll pour it into a little jam jar, which is actually a Hillman's mayonnaise jar, but it doesn't evaporate out of there, which I thought was quite clever. Um, let's see what it went off. Yeah. And that's by and large uh, what I've got to say about the whole thing. I do have one of Jim's top tips though. On one of the videos we just saw, and uh, I watched a YouTube video today about using the marker method, um, magic marker. And they all take a magic marker and they put a bit of black ink on the thing. Now, if I hold it up, oh, yeah, there we, actually, it's not too difficult to see just there, especially against my black shirt. And then just by fluke, one day, this is Jim's, Jim's hot tip. If you take a red magic marker with a broad tip, it's a damn sight easier to do, as well as, I don't know if this will show on the camera, it shows up so much easier and with my aging eyesight or whatever it is. I do it all the time. It works great. Um, any other little notes? No, I think I'm done. Yeah, that's me. Jim, yeah, I have a question. Yeah. Um, because the wheel sits in the water bar, what's stopping it? Flinging water around the all around the room as it spins. Does the water right. come out? There we go. Yeah, because the water, because the wheels in the in the bar. What stops the, the water being flinged out the bar? It's not fast enough spinning. I used to have one, and it it's slow spinning. Yeah. So all you get is a little bit of water on the point that you're sharpening. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, it's now running eighty RPM. And what I'm going to do is pour the water in. And you notice the water is all here. On the, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. It's running off of my finger. The water is not actually lifting off of the wheel at any point. The water is just maintaining the film all the way across the wheel. Um, and it's actually quite a thick film. It's probably over a millimeter of, of thickness of water on the top of the wheel right there. But none of the water is lifting off of the wheel. I had a similar one, Jim, and the reason I stopped using it was because I got fed up with the water evaporating and the sediment and everything else. Yeah. Jim, uh, Bob Marshall has a question. Do you use the honing wheel? <laughs> I spent a lot of time with that honing wheel. Uh, setting it up and oiling it and putting all this jolly stuff on it. And I honed all my kitchen knives and I tried honing my chisels and what have you. And I thought, this is a messy and pointless exercise. So I used it once. I've never used the honing wheel again. No, I don't. I was exactly the same with mine. They come out, they come out like razor blades just on the diamond wheel. I don't use mine either. Any other questions for Jim? Yes, I've got one. Jim, are you you going to um, wholesale us your red marker tip? <laughs> the club? Oh, oh yeah, that, that, I, I, I do a little marketing thing on that. Um, yeah, I can bring them along to club night or I can um, sell them by email. Um, this this red marker that it will last for quite some time and, and they're only nine pounds ninety nine each. Brilliant. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Jim. In one in one sentence, what's the big advantage you have of this of the grinding wheel? Right. Well, keep it short. Just oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. David, I'm six foot nine, mate. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. The reason I finished up with a Tormek is I walked into Axminster 
knowing nothing about it, okay? Um, and I, I was basically told there's two ways of doing it, neither of which did he say grinder, okay? He showed me a Tormic and he showed me that belt system. He's, uh, I forget what it's called. The belt system it runs over. Pro, pro Edge. Pro okay. Edge. Pro yeah, edge. Um, and the Pro Edge system just seemed to me to just be a bad idea. Um, I felt it was going to heat up the tools or something. And I just didn't like it. And there's, there's no hollow ground on a Pro Edge, obviously. Um, and that was about it. Mm. And so I ended up spending an absolute bloody fortune on this machine. Um, and then, of course, you don't get the, um, you know, the, the jigs like that. That's a, a wood turning jig kit, part of the kit. And that's another one. There's a couple others as well around in other places and little things like that, which you've all seen in there as well. Probably. Oh, and, and uh, David, when it comes to uh, turning your little like carbide disc or whatever it is, it's a variation on this. You take a different spindle and put it inside there, and then you can sharpen it on there. Any other questions, gentlemen and lady? I've Any got a question. Questions? Yeah. Um, as that's a diamond wheel and running very slowly. Yes. Have you tried using it dry? I'd be frightened to. Oh, um, and no, could, I have, no, I haven't, Terry. You no. could put CBN and diamond dry. What's that, Brian? You can run both CBN and diamond dry. Uh, I would have thought so. Because you don't oh, need the water oh, for coffee. Oh, really? Um, you know, the chafe somewhere else and it goes into the water down there. And yeah, the, the, what the water does, I find, is keep the stone, the wheel nice and clean. But I don't yeah. think it's needed, especially on a stone, a slow speed one like that. I don't think it's needed for cooling. So, yeah. maybe worth a try. The one feature with CBN, and I suspect it's the same with Diamond, is that it puts the heat into the chip. Not into the tool and not into the wheel. It, all the heat goes into the chips. Really? So, so it's safe. I didn't know that. Uh, and in fact, and I think on CBN, it doesn't like water. Uh, it, it, there's a reaction with CBN. I'm not sure whether it's the bond that it doesn't like or whether it's the grit. I heard today on the uh, um, Axminster videos on YouTube, the ones they do at three o'clock on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, there's Jason doing the video today. And he, he was quite derogatory about diamond wheels. He was saying that there's a chemical reaction between high speed steel and the diamond wheel. I'm thinking, mm. hmm, come on. Well, I'd like to pass a few comments. Um, in my working life, I worked with uh, the Institute of Grinding down yeah. at Bristol University, and we spent a lot of time uh, with the CBN <laughs> wheels and working working out how uh, they they survived and what to do with them. And see, that's when we found that the the CBN, if you wanted to wash the grits away, you used oil, not water, uh, and you, you need to, in production. You need to get the grits away, the grit away, that's, so that you, you you do wash it with oil. And CBN likes being lubricated, so when it's cutting, it's actually being lubricated with the oil. Hmm. It goes into the chips. So does that mean, Brian, you could run that in a bath of white spirit? So uh, possibly, I don't know. I, 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 I've got no experience of that. Be rather messy and smelly. It would. There are two types of CBM wheel. There's the electroplated, and you've got an electroplated diamond, which is a metal disc with a plated layer of diamond on it. And there's a matrix type of CBM wheel where it has got a band of what looks like a grinding wheel 
mixed in on the outside of an ordinary grinding wheel. And in production, uh, that's multi-component multi, um, production, you can use those wheels and you only have to dress the wheel every several thousand uh, parts you grind. So that's the, the strength of CBN. And when you do dress it, you only dress it by about five microns. I'm led to believe you don't dress CBN wheels at all. Well, you can't the metal plated one. You can only do it with the matrix one. Big problem. Right. Uh, so the, the CBN lasts for a very long time. It's very hard and stays sharp for a very long time. Now, I'd just like to go back now to the other types of wheel. Uh, first of all, uh, diamond is the hardest. CBN's the next hardest. Silicon carbide after that, then a ceramic, and then aluminium oxide. With aluminium oxide, ceramic, and silicon, silicon carbide, how they work is that when the edge of the grit gets blunt, it either splits the grit and discards it and presents a new edge, or when it gets too much of a load, it tears the grit out to expose another grit. And you have to reduce the bond of the, uh, the wheel to open up new grits when you've got a, a really dull wheel. So that's why you do the dressing on an aluminium oxide wheel and, and the silicon carbide wheels that you don't have to do on the CBN or the diamond. Mm. Um, what else was I going to say? Uh, that's all on that. I, I've just got a, a comment for Jeff on his, uh, his diamond discs. Um, you could mount that on a motor, Jeff. So, can you hear me, Jeff? Oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Mount, mount them on a motor. Yeah, mount it on a motor, and then you won't have any clutter in front for doing your dressing. It would just be like a belt sander, but it's a disc. Yes, um, I'm just thinking. I'm, I'm. A, there's probably a contradiction in terms, but um, I've got a grinder behind me, a crew song, not in the kitchen like Jim. Um, which I use for shaping, um, and the rest is done. I'm trying to do it on the lathe, and that dis that lot dissembles so quickly. Oh, right, okay, just a comment. <laughs> um, mounting it on another motor that's that's more complicated for me. I, it's, it's easy for you to be honest, but not so easy for me. I'm not really an electrics man, <laughs> right. But okay. thanks anyway, it's interesting. We have one more presentation, and that's from Gennady, who's going to talk to us about diamond slips. I thank you very much. Um, I would like Adam to run that video by James Barry. He would explain quite a few things. Uh, I would just add a little bit extra after the video is finished. Thank you. Bear with me. Just joining in. Oh. Trend now sell two different types of diamond credit cards, both double-sided and precision flat. I'm just going to show you now what the difference between the two are and how you can make your choice of which one you want. So what we have is basically a 600 grit fine side, ideal for tungsten carbide, general sharpening, utility knives. Then you've got the choice of having the 600 grit and the 300 grit. And the 300 grit is ideal for high speed steel and general sharpening turning tools. Or you can go for the 600 grit and the 1000 grit, which is obviously ideal for all the carving tools and very fine sharpening of knives. I'll show you very quickly how some of these do actually work. The 600 grit is ideal for the carbide, as I've already mentioned. 
I'm just going to show you how quickly this will sharpen something like a router bit. So what we do is just put a little of the trend lapping fluid on there. I'm going to put that onto a work surface. We always sharpen a router bit from the flat side. So I'm coming in from there and I'm working purely on the flat side. Count on one side and count on the other side to keep it in balance. That is how quickly it will cut the carbide. Turn it over and do the same amount of strokes on the other side. And we've already sharpened that route a bit. But this is how quickly the 600 grit cuts carbide. So similarly, because we are working purely on the flat side to do a shape, you can also use the 600 grit for sharpening things like your carbide inserts on a variation of turning tools. And all you are doing is simply working that on the flat side to, to re-hone that totally. So the 600 grit is ideal for your carbide. The 300 grit is ideal for general purpose sharpening and for your turning tools. So something that, and high speed steel. So the 300 grit again, ideally if you're going to sharpen something like your gouge, hit that on that shoulder, increase the angle till you can feel you're on both sides, increase it by about one degree and in a light circular motion, you're quite simply putting an edge back on there that quickly. It is that quick and so easy to use. So the 600-300 is sort of like the general purpose turning. The 600-1000, ideal for your carving tools and very, very sharp precision sharpening. I'll just quickly show you how the 1000 grit works on something like a knife. I'll just put a little bit more fluid on there. And the trick to it all is very little pressure and let the diamond do the work. So I'm just taking this very softly and slowly down one side, turning that over, and very light and softly down the other side. A couple of very, very light strokes usually is all that it will take. The slower and softer you do it, the more you're in control. And the idea is, is that on something like your carving tools, that you can achieve an edge which is like that very very quickly. The Trend double sided credit cards are actually the thickest on the market. This is the blank from how they used to be and you can see how flexible they were. With the introduction of so many carbide inserts coming onto the market now to having the ability of sharpening those effectively on something that is flat it is important that it is precision flat, hence the additional width and thickness. So those are the two types of trend credit card stones. You've got the 600 and 300 and you've got the 600 and 1000. Right, thank you very much. Um, so I sharpen my tools in combination with, um, so um, I shape my tools and, sh and do first sharpening on CBN wheels. Uh, probably with the hindsight, I would, I would buy uh, probably a ruby wheel. I agree with, with Terry on this, but because I already own CBN wheels, I use them. Uh, I use not trend, but uh, DMT. Uh, diamond credit cards. GMT is an American company and arguably they produce best diamond owning stuff in the world. I don't know, they, they take pictures on the microscope and they show you this and that, but yes, they have a huge, huge range of things, of tools that they, uh, they produce. So you have like a round profile sharpener. So I use this if I need to remove a burr from a, um, a bowl gouge when it's sharpened. And if, if there's a burr, if, if I put a burr during the sharpening process, and if that burr is, is thick or big enough that you know first cut in wood would not take that burr, I would just put it in the foot and would drag it, drag it out and repeat the geometry of my, of my foot. So that's a nice thing. And you can see that it you know, goes back into the handle. So as I said, DMT makes different honing tools, different grids. So 
Um, the only downside with GMT cards is that uh, trend cards have both sides that are functional. So you have two grids and one card, whereas DMT cards have only one side, um, which is functional. And so the price, you know, they're a little bit, a little bit more expensive than trend cards. So Where can you obtain these uh, cards? Uh, trend cards uh, you can buy on Amazon for 10. Sorry, can you repeat what you just said? Who's the supplier of the rat tail, the thin one in that looks like a pen knife? Oh, um, you can buy them anywhere. Amazon, I don't know, really? probably even our customers may have them. Um, so I prefer to use cards. So for instance, if I sharpened my gouges or um, other tools, I would sharpen once and probably I would go through 10, five cycles of resharpening with my diamond cards. It's just so much easier and faster. They're just in front of me on the shelf. I just reach out with my hand, it takes me about 20 seconds. And, you know, it saves me those critical minutes going, <laughs> doing journey to my uh, bench grinder, setting it up and doing all that stuff. The only thing is I, I would suggest how to make the whole thing a little bit easier. Um, I, I take my uh, my gouge or my tool and I rest the handle, let's say on bedways and the rest of the tool I put under my armpit. So in that way, it's quite, quite stable. So it doesn't play around, you know? So you have your, your, your tool stable um, the end of the tool, let's say on some on a hard surface, the rest is under your armpit, and the tip is in your hand, so it doesn't wobble. So, and when you take a card, it's also a little trick. So one hand, it's kind of counterintuitive, but you know you have to learn. Um, with one hand, you have to exert some strength to give stability to uh, to your tool, to your cutter. But the, with the other hand, you have to be somewhat relaxed. So if you exert too much strength on, 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 with a cut on your cutting edge, uh, that's when the problem comes, which Terry signified, that you may roll over the edge. Uh, so one hand, you apply strength. With the other hand, a little bit relaxed. Um, that's, that's it, basically. And then you, you just need to practice. And I, I tried the circular motions, which James suggested in the video, it didn't work with, uh, for me. So what I did, I just used the motions of repeating the geometry, like um, just going around, if it, if it is uh, uh, going up a little bit, but yes, keep it. Any questions you can ask me. Gennady, what? Yes. What's with the lapping fluid in that video? Yes, um, it's quite important to use it because it, it acts as a lubricator and it removes chips from the card. So you buy this fluid from Axminster, I don't know, Amazon, eBay. It's a trend lapping fluid. You can buy a big bottle, which will last you forever. Or buy a small one, which will last you forever as well. <laughs> one or two drops, that's it. It's not just oil. Thin oil? Um, probably not. I wouldn't use oil. And when it get, uh, gets dirty a little bit, so you just take it to your sink in the kitchen, put some cream, cream cleaner on it, and you know, with the rough side of your sponge, just clean it. Mm. Uh, dry it with a kitchen towel. Mm. And that's it. Mm. Ready to go. So, yes, um, I use it because it saves me time. Just more enjoyable, and uh, yeah, I use it in combination with my CBN wheels. Any other questions for any of our presenters? Um, Gennady, how much were those discs each, uh, rather than your cards? Oh, the cards. Yeah, I just checked the prices. So two-sided trend cards on Amazon is sold for 
10 pounds something pence, I can't remember. So just in excess of 10 pounds. These three cards made in the United States, they sold for 30 pound, three cards. So per card is the same price. But the problem is with these cards, it's only one side that you can use. On the other side, you have just a fancy mm -hmm. sticker, yeah. which tells you what grid it is. And that's 300, the blue is 300. The red one is 600, and the green one is 1,200. Okay, thanks. It's cheap enough. It is. Yes, they're good. They're good. David, you said that you had a general question. Well, I think the question has been discussed. It's this. I want to know how to sharpen that, but uh, I've got some ideas and Jeff has also offered to help out with it. I bought it brand new and it's quite blunt. It's never been sharpened. Uh, no, that's a good question as well, please. Um, probably only to Terry and Jim. When I first got a lathe, I was told that the optimum height for comfort and control was that when you stood at the lathe and bent your arm, the bend of the, your elbow should be at the height of the tool rest or thereabouts. And that gave you optimum comfort and control. But I couldn't help noticing, probably because Jim is so tall, that when you were standing in front of your tourmic, um, it was very much lower down. Do you find there is a, a comfortable height for, and a safe height for using this sort of thing? Okay, in my particular case, um, the uh, my lathe, I had to put on, uh, I think it's on four inch fence posts laying on the side to get, it, it's not the tool rest, it's the spindle. Um, up to your other height, okay? Um, also, don't be deceived, I built this kitchen, or I had it built, I didn't physically do it, and my countertops are raised to accommodate my height. I think they're raised uh, higher than standard by about two and a half or three inches. Mm. For grinder height, I, I like them really high. So you can really see closely what you're doing. Up sort of chest height. Yeah. Okay. The, the tiny Turner, Emma, whatever her name is, um, her spindle height is roughly at her shoulders. <laughs> I saw her doing a demo once. Very sweet little thing. She's, I think she's what, four foot ten or something? Four foot nine. <laughs> Can I float an idea? Mm. Um, I spent all yesterday uh, with my grinder. It's a wet, wet stone grinder. It's not a tall mat, it's the jet. This is very similar. Um, I've never been able to master how to use the, the, uh, the, the bowl gouge attachment because in the uh, manual with the, with the machine, it doesn't tell you how to set for particular cutting things. So I've been playing around with it and I set up a 45 degree front uh, angle and I, I, I ground this um, uh, gouge and I couldn't get the side flanks so that they were level. They were all peaked and rough. And I remembered hearing someone uh, actually saying, you, before you start grinding a, a bowl gouge, you grind the top flat at the angle you want to end up at. And I, I got fed up with this rough edge, so I tried it. And what happens is, you get a band on the top there uh, that's a, a, a land of where you've got to grind to. And so you can actually work the tool round on your jig and spend more time where the, that band is thick 
and you can get a nice even shape to the tool. Uh, so I, I really was pleased with that and I ground all of my uh, uh, tools yesterday to that shape. And yes, they do cut nicely. The other thing that I found out is that I use a matrix dresser of the T shape, like the one that uh, Terry doesn't like. Um, and and I, I hold that against the uh, tool support arm right up against the wheel. So that there's virtually no clearance. So I don't get any tip on, on that um, dresser. I dress the wheel to get rid of the lousy grooves I got in there from sharpening freehand. And I didn't condition the wheel. And with, with the wheel not conditioned, it cuts like a dream. It really does remove the material fast. If you want to get a very fine finish, then you put the conditioning block on, which flattens down the, the grit so that there's not so much clearance between the grit top and the bond. So that's how you get the fine finish afterwards. But I found I could get a good finish even with the, uh, the open wheel that I got from dressing. And by putting burnishing paste on the leather wheel, I was able to get a, a nice fine uh, gloss on the cut edge. So the only thing I'm now not, not quite clear of, how to adjust the angles on this grinding gauge to change the angles that I want on the tool. Uh, because there's no real guidance and you've got so many variables like the depth of the flute I've found varies on two similar chisels so they're going to be set at different positions to get the right uh, uh, wing shape uh, you've got the angle of the pivot in the fixture which has got about five or six different settings on it You've got the length of the protrusion of the chisel out of that guide and you've got the distance from the wheel I just can't get my head round which ones to change to get to the different angles. So I've got a little bit of a learning curve here. I don't know whether anybody else has gone through that already. Uh, I can answer that. Can I? It sounds like an RTFM job. <laughs> can, can I make a suggestion? I just make that. You can see it. No, oh, your background's taking it out. Is that visible? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Square bit of wood that with a hole to fit the Tormac um, jig. Yeah. And then I just squared it up, cut circles at various depths so that every time I want, and then marked them all, of course, so that if I want a certain protrusion, between the jig and the wheel, I simply put this to one, two, three, or four, right. slide it up, fairly rough and ready, don't need to be accurate, like the plastic one that Jim showed, the official torment one, throw it up and fix it. And I've now got four, and that's all I use. If I want to make a fifth, I simply change one of these or cut a new square. Do you keep the protrusion of the tool the same through the fixture then? A bit like um, one of the videos, I've got cutouts, so I push it up to wherever my cutout is. Right. So I can replicate as much as possible. I'm Scottish, so I don't like wasting metal. No. So, <laughs> so the closer it is, I like the, the closer tip. it is to being the same, the less metal I waste. I like the tips, but how do you decide what settings to use? Uh, that's that's on the lathe. Which one do I prefer? Now, which, how do you set up the pivot angle on the on the on the gate on the fixture? Oh, how, right. do you, how, do you, how do you know which one to use? Is this what they call the G angle on Tormek? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I found that one slipped with me slightly, so I sod it. I set them all to one of two, and I happen to have two. I can't remember why, but for some reason I've got two. One's at one angle, one's at another, and that's all I use. Right. So, for example, a double-sided one, which um, Terry showed, um, with a you know with a axminster handle. Yep. I've got one for inside of balls, which is very 
short cut off, whatever you call it, um, acute. And and the other one is much more for the outside. Right. And it's just because the that angle is either on zero or it's on two. Right. Thank you. Brian, are you um, asking how to set the gauge, the jig to suit a particular grind? Yes. Um, Just for example, way to... <laughs> for example, I've got the 40 degrees, the 45 degrees at the front. I've got the fingernail or, or I've got no fingernail. Well, it's a... If you've got an example that you want to copy, so you maybe you've bought a gouge or you're happy with the gouge and you want to be able to go back, have the jigs all set for it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, the principle is the same with the Tormek as with the, the very grind. It's got a hinge. Yeah. It's got a pivot point. Um, yeah. and, and you can move the, the rail in and out. Yeah. And it's also got projection distance. Yeah. So what you want to do is settle on the fixed projection distance okay whatever torment advise two inches or whatever it is and you never change that then you set the gouge in put the the jig on the uh tormek. doesn't matter what the settings are set them at random then it's a process of iteration you t i can't show you on the torment one i haven't got it here but you turn it over sideways so yeah sideways so the gouge wing comes down onto the stone right yeah then you slide the uh, and you black it up first for yep. this process then you or red it up if, if jim uh, is right then you slide the arm out yeah and you've got contact on the wing yes right then lock that turn it upright and adjust the angle until you've got contact on the nose. Right. right. Then you go back to the side again and tweak it a bit. And then you go back and tweak it a bit more. And you find if you do it two, maybe three times, it all sort of hones in on the exact settings for that particular shape of grind. Oh, right. Well, you've actually given me the clues of how to experiment. That's good. Yeah. So moment. wing, nose, wing, nose, yeah. okay. iteration, and it gets, the error gets less and less and less as you go. And well, then when you've got it right, you make your setting templates. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I looked at the Tormac settings in their, their manual, because I happened to have one of those, and, and they changed the protrusion and the distance from the wheel and the angle. For different tools, they change. Different tools, yeah. Well, there are some shapes, some grinds that those jigs can't do. You have to do them freehand, right? Um, so you may have one that just isn't reproducible that way. But um, mostly, you can do it. I think. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. I'll have a go at that. Anybody else got any questions? Can I ask a question? Uh, I, I once saw a demonstrator who said, when you're grinding, most of us, as, as all everybody said tonight, you go left to right and then back and back and back when you're grinding a, a ball gouge or a spindle gouge. And he said, don't do that. Go left to right, left to right, left to right. Because if you do left, right, back and forwards, you're doubling the amount of steel you're taking off the center compared to the edges. Right. Yes, does that do. make any sense? Yes, it does. It does, it's true. Yeah. Depends on the shape. Uh, but just a question. Uh, it's comment. obvious when you think about it, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So you said, don't do what we all do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Fascinating. Thank you, David. Yeah, well, many thanks to all the presenters. What a fascinating evening, particularly Terry, who gave us an hour of his time, and I thought he was brilliant. Um, learned a lot. Very, very good. So thank you for coming in from outside. 
Will the non-members come again? The next meeting is a members evening where we just chat and coffee, but unfortunately there's no coffee. And that is on uh, first Wednesday of April, not sure the date. And following that, we have a demo by Les Thorne. Subjects still to be decided, but uh, that will be on the three, third Wednesday of April. So everyone is invited, members, non-members, football senior. And once again, thank you for a really, really fascinating evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stay well. Thank you all. It was a good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks. Good night. Goodbye, everybody. Take Goodbye. care. Jim, Jim, thank you very much. Off to go and cook my dinner. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, Adam.